Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. Stimmy Vibrations, a day to celebrate autistic voices, will be on this Saturday, April 2nd. We have 11 great podcasts that will be joining us on this day, and you will not want to miss out on it. So in order to participate and listen to these podcasts for Stimmy Vibrations, you must register, and a link to do that can be found in the podcast description of this episode. Activism and advocacy is an essential part of my life, and that's why I'm really excited to talk with Lindy Treese today about her activism, why she prefers to be called an activist instead of a self-advocate, and what led her to pursue a master's in social work. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Lindy, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I want to start off by just kind of learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? So, when I was about two years old, I started showing very noticeable signs of developmental delays, which led to the process of testing my hearing, and then it was determined that I could, in fact, hear. I was not interacting with other people and reaching the developmental milestones that were expected of my age. And eventually we found out that I was autistic. And so I went through a lot of different interventions. Some were really amazing. Some were not as great. And then I got to where I am here today. The interesting thing about being diagnosed so young, though, is that my parents actually took a different route and they told me about my diagnosis really early on. So I've known for the past 23 years or so that I'm autistic and that I'm on the spectrum. I'm interested in that because, you know, sometimes parents will ask, when should I tell my child that they're autistic? Um, What do you have like an opinion about that? I think there are age appropriate ways to tell your kid about what they are experiencing because It's been my experience working in the special education system that even kids whose parents don't tell them about their disabilities or their conditions, they know that they're not in the mainstream classrooms for a reason, and they know that there's something different about them. They just don't have the words to describe it yet. Makes a lot of sense. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about um, language because I read that instead of um, referring to yourself as a self-advocate, you prefer the term activist instead. Where does that preference for you come from? Honestly, it's not a super strong preference. It's more just how I view the word self-advocate versus activist. I don't believe that I am simply advocating for myself, but rather that I'm an activist, someone who makes a lot of noise and is on the front lines fighting for systemic change. Now, I think when people think about activism, they oftentimes get a fixed idea of what this is. But in reality, it can come in so many different forms and and shapes. One area for you it seems to be occurring in your life as you will have your master's in social work, I believe, by the end of the year. Where do you envision social work in your role as an activist? I will be graduating soon, and that's really exciting. I actually used to work in the tech field, and 
when I was working in tech, I encountered a lot of the barriers that a lot of autistic adults face in finding and maintaining employment. That was actually what led me to pursue my passion in activism. And I looked at different schools and different programs. And the reason I picked out social work specifically was because the profession is unique in that it has a code of ethics that the professionals in the field are expected to follow. And it's not a values neutral profession. It has very clearly stated values. And I read um, that you took a class um, in the process of getting your degree in qualitative research and you had the opportunity to create a focus group to research the connection between autism and trauma. What did you learn um, in this process about that connection? It's actually quite an extensive connection. It's a bigger connection than I knew about before going into the class. What our group found was that there's essentially three schools of thought around the connection between trauma and autism. The first is that children who have more adverse childhood experiences are more likely to be correlated with children who also receive diagnoses. The second is that living as an autistic person in a world that was not designed for you in a world where you experience constant stress and meltdowns and burnout is really exhausting and can be traumatic in its own sense. And then the third is that some of the interventions that are prescribed for autistic people in themselves can teach us to be afraid of other people and be afraid to be ourselves. What were some of those interventions um, kind of specifically that you found? So we found that interventions that really focused on one specific way of communication were harmful for autistic folks and that there needs to be more acceptance of neurodiversity in order to lessen the trauma that autistic people experience and acquire. So kind of really focusing on each person's preferred method of communication is very helpful in the process. Right. And just recognizing things like how people don't always look like they're listening in a very standard way. So for example, I often don't make eye contact when I am speaking or listening to somebody. But a lot of the interventions that I went through when I was a kid really pushed the eye contact. And I just found that so distressing and so traumatic that I wish instead of that, that there had been more acceptance around the fact that, hey, I don't make eye contact, but I'm still listening to you. Now, in talking about activism and being an activist, Something that you do is you sit on your county's Developmental Disabilities Advisory Board, and last year you were elected to the position of vice chair. What, what are the responsibilities of that position? I mostly help out with running the public meetings. About a week before each public meeting, me and the manager of the program and the chair of the advisory board, we all get together on a conference call and we review the agenda and we talk about the topics that are going to come up and what people are interested in discussing. And then I also get to help lead work sessions where the board just meets by itself without public input. And then something that I did a lot of that wasn't solely the responsibility of my position was that I got to meet with a lot of my elected officials in the local area and talk to them about the priorities on our legislative agenda. So things that were important to us that the community said was important. 
And what was just kind of your overall feeling of the response from these elected officials? Well, you know, they're very busy and they're very good at smiling and nodding <laughs> and saying that they'll take your opinion into consideration. What it really comes down to, though, is how they vote. So we also give them a list of recommended bills and talk about how our opinions specifically apply to the legislation. Because you can go into these meetings and you can say stuff like, yeah, autism rights, and they have no idea how to apply it in practice. And other than uh, talking with uh, elected officials, um, are there some ways you feel like you've been able to make a difference being on a developmental Disabilities Advisory Board? I think just being there as an autistic activist really makes a difference. So in social work, we have this saying that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, which is basically a metaphor that says if you are not in the discussion representing the interests of your community, then people don't get to hear from you. They don't get to know and learn from your experience. And you also don't really have any right to complain about it if you are not there representing. Well, and, and, and I always say at the beginning of each episode of Autism Stories that aut autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience. And hearing from your expertise has to be valuable. I believe so. Now, people don't necessarily have to be on a on an advisory board or do some of these other things that you do to be an activist. In fact, they don't even have to necessarily leave their home. I know you have a blog that you talk about your role as an activist and experiences being autistic. What do you hope that the people that read your writing take away from those experiences? So yes, you are right that activism doesn't have to look one way. And what I find a lot with the autistic community is that it's really hard for us to break through that, what I nickname the puzzle piece ceiling. So it's kind of like the women's rights movement having to break the glass ceiling. I call it the puzzle piece ceiling because I try to be funny like that. Like, there are just so many spaces that are designed to not have autistic input that it can be really distressing and exhausting having to push against them all the time. So I think it takes a very special kind of activist who is willing to be on advisory boards and work within those kind of systems. But another thing that I really like to do is I like publishing content on my own. I've had some of my work published in different magazines and online platforms. And I guess what I'm hoping that somebody would take away from that is sort of going back to one of your earlier questions about telling kids that they're autistic, whether you should or you shouldn't. I've always believed that kids know if they have something about them that's causing them to not fit in with their peers. And so when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time on the internet trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I mean, I knew that I was autistic, but I wanted to know like why I had this condition and I wanted to know like what happens to people with this condition because I'll be honest, the first time I ever had an autistic friend that I knew was autistic, I was 19 years old and I was in college. So I guess I write in order to combat some of the misinformation that's out there. And it's going to sound really corny, but to just tell people out there who need that affirmation that things are going to be okay. Now 
Over the years, I've seen so many activists burn out because they're so passionate about what they do uh, and their self-care may suffer as a result. How do you maybe take care of yourself so you can be there to do the great work you do and show up for others? I love to knit. I started knitting when I was 10 and I'm 25 now, so I think... If I'm doing the math correctly, that's 15 years. And I also have just lived the kind of life where I knew that I was autistic so early on. I began that journey of activism so early, and it's really been ingrained into all of my formative years that I just can't see myself not being an activist. It feels natural to me. And, um, like, in terms of energy, do you feel like it's taking away energy from you? Like, gives you energy? I'm just curious about kind of that aspect of it. I feel like there have been times when I have been really exhausted by the work. And it can be really hard to face people's attitudes. And especially when I am an activist... And sometimes I don't come out as autistic immediately. It can be really hard to hear people's true thoughts that they would not say to me if they knew I was autistic. But I don't feel as of today that it really has impacted my energy because I have a really strong family unit and I have an autistic brother And we actually suspect that my dad is autistic and he has really been in my corner and he's been rolling with the idea that maybe he has been autistic for his entire life. And so when I talk to my dad about that kind of stuff, a lot of it is starting to make sense to him. And uh, beyond this interview, how can people learn about you and your activism? I have a really awesome Twitter account. It's at Lindy underscore Trees, which I hope Doug will be including a link to that somewhere in the description. Absolutely. And I tweet really awesome things about autism acceptance, neurodiversity, affirmative care, and cute pictures of cats. Well, you can't go wrong with cats, that's for sure. (laughs) And that will definitely be, there will be a link for that in the the description for this episode. Uh, That's for sure, Lindy. Uh, It was really a a great and enjoyable time uh, talking with you. Thanks so much for making the time for me today. Thank you, Doug. Thanks so much to Lindy for the conversation. To learn more about Lindy, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Supporting people in advocacy is something Autism Personal Coach does with coaching all of our clients in some form or fashion. If you have an interest in in learning more about how we can help you to better advocate for what you want and need in your life, then book a call with me today. A link for the free call can be found in the podcast description of this episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.